enjoy working with them. And the recording's in progress, yay. Um, so with that, we'll get started. Uh, first off, I don't know how many folks are on here that are relatively new, but I wanted to show you, um, always be sure to check down here at the version number to make sure that you're looking at the correct version. Um, there's a little confusion on this at the moment for me. What you will likely see on all your documents is on version, it'll say 1-1-2024. Now, there was a little um, mix up, if you will, on the contract that got corrected. And my understanding was they were going to redo the version to make it 1-9-2024. But on everything that I've seen, it has not been changed. So to be candid, I'm not sure which way they're going to go. But when we get to that point, I'll stop and show you uh, a little more in detail what I'm talking about. But always try to make sure it's it's a 2024 form that you're dealing with. Um, do you guys use what? Uh, are you transaction desk or what do you? We use? are now. Yep. Okay. Good. Okay. All right. Um, first form is the right to sell, exclusive right to sell, and nothing major. We tweak the compensation uh, portion where it's talking about what you're going to get paid line 62 to say in the event the property is leased during the term rather than under the terms because this is not a lease uh, listing type agreement so it uh, it didn't really make sense this doesn't wasn't really intended to control the leasing of property it's really so really it's just if it happens to be leased during the term you can put in this space what it is you expect to get paid um the other was just clean up uh, it works exactly the way it did last year. It just reads a little nicer. Um, and what we're doing here is we're talking about when you talk to your seller, you know, what percentage um, do you want to offer a cooperative compensation? If so, what percentage? And do you want to offer it to only members of the MLS or can we offer to non-MLS members as well? So it works the same way as it did. It just reads a little better. And that's really it on that form. Okay, the buyer's rep agreement. Again, some cleanup of sorts. If you look on line 38, um, if a fee is not offered or paid to broker, we struck the part that said, as could occur, for example, in the purchase of an unlisted property, because that's not, while that is true, that's not exactly, it's fairly limiting. And okay. that's not, so only reason that um, a fee might not be offered, it might not be offered solely because they're not offering a cooperative share. Um, certainly y'all heard of the, it does. the yeah office. okay and anybody can do a VA loan um, for the most part too so there we go sorry I unmuted Good, yep. I was hoping you catch that <laughs> the other thing we did, yeah, that would be bad, wouldn't it? You're talking. Uh, we added paragraph F on line 55. Um, should the broker consent to release the rep agreement prior to expiration of the term, um, the buyer agrees to pay all costs incurred by the broker or other amount as agreed to by the parties as a, as a cancellation fee, in addition to any other sums that may be due to broker. There was language to that effect in the listing agreement, we added it to the buyer's rep agreement because again, you know, Tennessee is ahead of the game in terms of encouraging people to use buyer representation agreements. And um, it is a con contract. It's an agreement where you have the exclusive right to represent somebody. And it may be that you agree to a termination, but you certainly don't have to. But if you do, um, it will likely be via one uh this next form which is the um mutual release hey todd so what we did in mutual release um we we took this language online 24 oh sorry okay 
Yeah. Hey there, Ashley Belcher here. Can you clarify the costs? Like, give examples of what costs um, could be incurred. Just I, I can think of some, but I don't know if they qualify necessarily. Like, if I'm explaining that to for the last bullet point, the cost incurred by the broker. Did that make sense? Can we lose them again? Um, maybe. I think he's frozen. It might be. It says he's still on here. My screen's black. Um, I can see the agreement. I just can't hear anything. Can you see him, Ashley? Uh, not anymore. I don't uh, think my screen just changed. Would be some thing good for the any marketing you did for the home video. You could, if you use that agreement, incur those as costs that you passed on to the seller or in uh, the buyer's. Is that I the think buyer's? That's, I think that's the buyer's I rep. I don't know what those might be. I know that's what I was curious expenses about. for taking them around. I, I don't know. I've never. Yeah, I was in a class and they said um, gas, um, you know, paid for their meal, whatever, things like that. That I mean, there's not as much probably on the buyer's side, but um, mm -hmm. it's really just sort of CYA and, you know, so that if you did have a big cost of some sort, um, or maybe I heard that at TA or I don't know where I heard that just recently. Okay. That's kind of what came to mind. I couldn't think of anything else um, necessarily. So I just wanted to clarify in case I was thinking kind of a, a clear thing. So thank you. CYA. Gina didn't elaborate on what that meant. Ah, sorry. I figured you could figure that out. <laughs> All right, hopefully we'll get him back here in a second, y'all. Maybe he's having a bad connection. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can get an answer that way. You gotta love technology. Right. We use Zoom a lot at church and it seems like it's never ending. Are you feeling better, G? Praise the Lord, I am. Finally, finally, finally. Yesterday I felt like I turned a corner. Oh good. Mm-hmm. It was um it was rough. No energy. I still have a lot of congestion and stuff, but I'm much better. Much better. Good. All right. I think we got Todd coming back. The only thing is, you know me, I'm not totally a homebody and I stayed home for five days straight with that. Now I'm stuck for another several. I'm like, ah! Um. Are there you, he is. Am I back? You're back. So I don't know what's going on with our internet. It's been spotty. Um, and I apologize. I guess what I'll do, because I don't know how long I'll get to talk to you. Um, <laughs> apparently Comcast is optional today. Um, I'm going to jump to the stuff that I think is the most important. How about that? So okay. if, if if all else fails, we'll we'll talk about the most important stuff. Um, okay, great. Um, Todd, Ashley was asking, um, Ashley, you want to get back on and ask that question again, what the buyer expense or um, what an agent could, ex could incur expense wise on the buyer rep agreement? Yeah, I was just curious what all that covers. Um, it just, I, you know, in case I'm missing anything obvious, like, you know, Gina was saying uh, gas and um, meals, maybe. And I, I just didn't know if there were other things, uh, I guess, advertising, maybe if you did pay for like buyer needs printouts or something. I don't know. 
Well, and I guess the answer is whatever you can negotiate and whatever, you know, your company, because really this, I think it's going to be broker dependent. I mean, they're not telling you what you need to recover or what you should expect to recover. It's whatever your broker says you can recover. Yeah. Um, so it's completely negotiable. Remember, they're asking you to get out of a, a binding contract. So, you know, and I guess too, you know, being candid, the money would have to flow through the company anyway. Right. So, Is that including time? Is that including hours spent could. by the brokerage? Okay. It could. I mean, you know, a lot of law firms have a, you know, a, a, a fee or a, or a cost that's associated with opening a new file. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it costs us $500 for everybody's time just to simply open up the file and get it ready to go. So mm -hmm. it may be that you guys discuss it and decide that that's what you want to try to do, or, or maybe you just let them go. I mean, yeah. but, but it's there. You can, you don't have to charge it certainly. Uh, but if you want to, it's there. Awesome. Thank you for clarifying. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, okay. Uh, let me talk about what I think is the most important stuff, which is coming up. Um, and then I'll try to retrench and go back and hit some other stuff. Um, in the 401, they added this thing about, make sure my d and on, uh, any wired electric vehicle wall charging stations. So that's been added to the stuff that stays automatically unless you specifically exclude it. So um, all, all the newer agents, really any agent, you always have to remember to really make your client read this section so that they understand what it is that's going to stay and what it is that what is going to go. So um, let's see here. Okay. Um, title expenses. They added this language underneath the title expenses. Uh, it's a buyer's responsibility to seek independent advice prior to closing from buyer's closing agency regarding availability of coverage provided under a standard owner's policy and if available, an extended owner's policy. Those are the generic terms for um, the title, the two types of title insurance that we typically see. So you've got a basic policy and you've got a an enhanced or some people call it, uh, First American calls it an eagle policy. They have different names for it, but it's this expanded coverage. And we put this in here so that you could at least have the conversation early on. Um, it's something that I usually try to bring up, but it's at the closing table in a lot of cases, and it's a little late to do it there. Uh, we're trying to get people to inquire early on so that if they want the enhanced policy, um, it's more expensive and you don't want to have to rerun numbers that could change things that might slow the closing down. So um, it's there just to remind them. Uh, and then you don't have to be the expert on it. Just simply refer them to whoever's closing the deal and they can decide if they want it or not, or even if it's available. The other thing, um, this is kind of big, I guess, the termite inspection section. Um, in the past, if there, if there was active infestation found, um, the seller was deemed to automatically agree to, to treat it. Well, now what they've done is they've struck that and made the treatment part of the negotiation during the resolution period. So if there's an active infestation, the seller no longer automatically has to, to treat it. Um, it's negotiated just like uh, repairs would be negotiated. So that's kind of a big change from what you're used to. Just want to make sure you're aware. Okay. Um, let's see. This is in the, um, the resolution period. It's going to look a lot different um, than it looked last year, but it works exactly the same way as it did last year. So at, at the conclusion of your resolution period, unless one of these three things occur, has occurred, the, the contract terminates. Okay, so um, this is the way it re reads. This agreement shall terminate at the end of the resolution period with a refund of earnest money unless one of the following occurs. The seller and the buyer enter into a repair replacement um, amendment. Excuse me. Um, the buyer uh, gives 
written notice to the seller that they're willing to take it as is, or you extend the resolution so that you can keep um, negotiating and arguing. So, yeehaw. So again, it works exactly the way it did last year. It just reads better. So um, the final inspection part of this thing. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna turn away from my materials here and go to look at the actual 401. Again, we had a little bit of a, a confusion or a problem there on the front end of this when we first released the forms. Um, for whatever reason, what was uploaded didn't get properly in, input into the system. I don't know what happened, but uh, bottom line is we had uh, the forms committee had voted for these two paragraphs to be separated. And for whatever reason, it did not end up that way, but now it's been fixed. And if you use transaction desk, the proper form is in there. Um, if you use something else, you, you would have to, I guess, reload it into your system, but but uh, it is fixed on transaction desk. Um, th this is how these two paragraphs work. In the event of completion of repairs deadline is not established in an amendment, um, the buyer shall use the final inspection to determine that all repairs agreed to during the resolution period have been completed. This is the part that's really important that was left out, frankly. Um, in the event repairs have not been completed by the established deadline, seller shall be considered in default of this agreement and the buyer may terminate via the notification form. Upon termination, earnest money goes back to the buyer. Um, kind of a big deal. Um, this part of the contract, um, you really need to read the, the Riot Act to your seller uh, about why it is they need to complete the repairs and do it in a way that um, that they can say in good faith they've they've met the terms of the repair amendment um, because you'll see in the notification form the buyer now it, it's the buyer if if the repairs are not done the buyer can send a termination and walk um, now. I'm not sure how much this changes because in a scenario where the the uh, buyer was I mean, excuse me the seller was supposed to complete repairs um and they didn't do it even without this language I think the seller's in breach but this really kind of puts a pretty fine point on it so um it's important for the buyer's agent and the seller's agent I think it's a mutual responsibility to make sure that when you do your repair amendments you're very precise about what you what you need done, who's doing the work, you know, and try to put as much uh, precision on that as you can, so that it's not arguable, you know, whether or not it was done appropriately. Does that make sense? Uh, the other option, of course, is just forget that and do some sort of, you know, money in lieu of repairs, which I'm kind of a big fan of, to be honest. That way, you don't even have to get into well, you didn't do this right, or you didn't do it, whatever. So um, I think that's another good argument for that approach, as opposed to getting the seller to actually do the repairs, or maybe avoid an argument. Um, and paragraph 10, this is how this works. Buyer and or buyer's uh, inspector shall have the right to conduct a final inspection of the property on the closing date or within blank number of days prior to the closing date, only to confirm the property's in the same or better condition as it was on the buying agreement date, normal wear and tear accepted property shall remain in such condition until closing at seller's expense. Closing of the sale constitutes acceptance unless otherwise mutually agreed in writing. So what we've done here is if, if you use a repair amendment and you establish a deadline for repairs, you can use you, you get that plus you get a final walkthrough or a final inspection as well. But if you fail to establish a repair deadline, then you're using your final inspection really for both both inspections. So that's the way it works. Any questions on that? If if not, okay. I'm gonna switch back over to this because again, this is a little easier to see what changed. Uh, let's go back to that just for one second. Sure. Yes, sir. 
So in nine, it says in the event repairs have not been completed by the established deadline. Well, say we did not create a deadline. Then if you did then you got the final inspection. Right. But I don't see the same language about at the final inspection if they have not been done where the uh, seller is in default to this agreement and buyer may terminate via the notification form. Well, it's in the event repairs have not been completed by the established deadline and right but above. I didn't have a deadline. Well, th this sentence right here on line 347, um, in the event a completion of, of, of repairs deadline is not established, the buyer shall use the final inspection to determine that all repairs and replacements have been completed. So we're talking about either or, I guess. I mean, okay. I, see, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, but I think They're the bottom line that we lump them together for purposes of, you know, that's our deadline. And it, it may be called a completion of repairs or it may be called a final inspection, but but they're this one and the same if if you fail to establish both. So that's the way it's interpreted. That's the way I interpret it now. Okay. It may be something, I mean, you you're the first person to raise that point. Um that's the way I would read it because of the way it flows. Um yeah. We can always go back and revisit and see if we need to tighten it up. But I think at the end of the day, if the buyer, if the seller has not done the repairs, um, I guess the question would be. Um, Should it say completed done? by the established deadline or final inspection? Yeah. yeah. Then the seller shall be considered. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's the way, the that's the way I read it. But yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, um, okay, this next thing is kind of important. Um, look at this on line 436, non-assignability. Uh, this purchase and sales agreement shall not be assignable by the buyer without prior written consent by the seller. That's 180 degrees from where we were. Um, previous to, to this year, the contract was assignable, freely assignable. Um, did not require the permission of the seller. Uh, not anymore. So if you have a client who um, is intending to assign this agreement, you're going to have to carve out that right. And, you know, you, you could go to special stipulations and just put this, this purchase and sales agreement can be assignable or can be assigned by the buyer without prior written consent. So it's easy enough to change it back to where it was, but the default now is that you cannot assign it unless the seller agrees. Okay. That's, um, it could be a really huge issue for people if they don't catch that. So um, you now know. Okay. Um, let's see, a couple other things. They added a sort of a savings provision on line 533. Um, any blank herein that is not otherwise completed shall be deemed to be zero or not applicable. Um, courts tend to not like blanks. Um, if it could be argued that uh, perhaps there was not a complete meeting of the minds, there were still terms that were open, that sort of thing. So we're just addressing that here as a blanket you know, look, if we left it blank, it's zero or it doesn't apply one or the other. Um, so the other thing they did was uh, they dropped this language about affixing your signature down below, right above where the signature lines go. Um, by affixing your signature, you acknowledge you've reviewed and understand all the terms, which hopefully they did. And that's a good thing. Um, the initials for the uh, wire fraud warning have, have been dropped. So they've taken that out. Um, it's my understanding you can still, if 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 you want to have somebody initial that, you could still drop a, a box in there and, and make them initial it is my understanding, but I'm not techie, so I don't know. But it's, uh, they're out for now, so. Okay, um, let's see, what was the other? 
that was really the termite letter and the um, assignability for me were the big changes um, that if you weren't aware of those, it could really cost you uh, some money or, or cause a problem. Um, let me drop back up and we'll pick up the ones we didn't talk about. Um, in the property condition disclosure, the link um, they took out, it was, I, my understanding was that they took it out because the link wasn't a good link any longer. It had been, it was a dead link. Um, if your client wants to read the statute, just have them Google the statute 665201. There are free websites now that you, you can look at the statute as long as you want to. And I know how people love to read statutes. So um, read away. The disclaimer notice, um, little a new paragraph. This language regarding title expenses uh, looks familiar because it's exactly what's in the 401 where we dropped it under the title uh, lines. Uh, and again, the goal here was to try to get your client to ask those questions early on so that you don't get to the closing table and all of a sudden they want a different policy. Um, so just another place to tell them about it. Um, let's see. Uh, that's not uh, the first right of refusal. Nothing major at all. Uh, you may remember last year um, we began our war on the word will and we changed all the wills to shalls. Uh, we've missed one. So uh, we continued our war on poor will. Um, the VA FHA addendum, nothing major, but we tightened up our verbiage a little bit. You know, when we talk about expenses, that's a defined term in the 401. We have buyer expenses, seller expenses, title expenses. These non-allowable uh, settlement charges are, they're separate and apart in a sense. They're not the typical charge and they're not covered by the expenses section. So we took the, ver the, the reference to the word expenses out just to tighten that up a little bit. So it's contemplating something other than those charges. Um, the temporary occupancy agreement. Just want to show you something here. We we made this shift in in several documents. If you look on line sixty nine, we struck the part that said upon execution by buyer and seller, and so now it just reads, "This occupancy shall become part of the PSA um, as if stated verbatim therein." Um, why did we take that out? Why did we take out upon execution by buyer and seller? Um, I could give away a gift card, but I don't know how I'd give it to you. Does anybody have a, a theory on why we would take that out? While I take a drink, sorry. Is it understood? Mm. <clears throat> well, think about when you do a contract. Um, the buyer signs it, right? Sends it over to the seller and the seller signs it. What's missing? Do we have a contract? Binding or I don't know. Well, I mean, you're on the right track. Um, Notification that the other parties received it. Boom. There it is. So, yeah, to, to, to become an agreement, there has to be an offer, so to speak, an acceptance and then communication of acceptance. In other words, you have to tell the other side, hey, um, I've accepted it. And this makes it sound as though if the buyer signs something and the seller signs something, but the seller never tells the buyer or never sends it back and communicates that acceptance that you were under, that it was part of the contract, which is not really how we do things. So I think this makes more sense. The way that this thing becomes part of the agreement is controlled by the PSA itself and all the boilerplate language in the PSA. And this first part really ran counter to how we normally do things. So um, it was a broker that found that who also happened to be a lawyer. So anyway, he's a nerd like me, I guess. Um, so we made that change in several in both temporary occupancy agreements. Uh, we also made it in um, closing possession amendment, blank amendment, all those kinds of things. So you'll see that in several forms. The 631, uh, it's a tenant information. They just added a place to put some email addresses. Nothing nothing to see there. 
Um, let's see, same there as far as taking out the binding part. The notification, wanted to show this to you. There's a checkbox there on 17. This works in conjunction with that um, completion of repairs situation we discussed earlier. So if you if your buyer needs to terminate the contract because the seller has not performed the repairs, you can use the notification form to do that. And so now there's another little box you can check. Um, if anybody doesn't use this 656 form, I would encourage you to seriously consider using it. It's um, very handy. Um, same change here as far as uh, when it's binding. Same with the blank amendment. The comp agreement, um, we added a new paragraph six here. And what we're doing is this is the agreement that you sign with the other, both, both agents sign it. Well, in a lot of cases, both agents are realtors and you're bound to the code of ethics and you're bound to arbitrate disputes. But in some cases you use this where you're compensating a non MLS member, right? It might just be a licensee, or maybe it's an agent who's not a member of our MLS. So they're not um, entitled necessarily um, to, uh, to a cooperative share. Well, for those situations where you're working with somebody who might be a licensee, but not a realtor, we're getting them to consent to the jurisdiction of the board if there's a, a dispute. So the way it reads, in the event of a dispute arising out of this agreement or related to procuring cause, the parties hereby agree to arbitrate pursuant to the code of ethics. So we're getting them to play by the same rules. You all are bound to do that as a membership duty. You have to arbitrate, but they ordinarily would not have to if they're not a member. So we're getting them to agree and submit themselves to the jurisdiction. Um, 707, additional contract language. Um, again, tightening things up. Some things we found um, in this seller to pay buyer expenses we noticed that we also reference title expenses and that that can cause some confusion. Those are com completely separate categories. And so um, you could, there could be a situation where uh, they would pay both expenses, right? Buyer expenses and title expenses. And you could always add that if you wanted to, but by and large, we're trying to separate those out. So that's what we're doing there. Um, Reduction in lieu of repairs. Again, we took out closing costs, prepaids, and instead we referenced buyer expenses because remember that's defined in the in the 401 and it tells you what expenses are included. So um, um, non-refundable earnest money. Um, just a slight tweak. Uh, we're if you've noticed over the years, we we really try to take out references to uh, numbered paragraphs because if we if we leave that in, then something changes. Then we have to go and change a hundred different forms because we're referring to paragraph twelve and it's no longer paragraph twelve; it's paragraph thirteen. So we're just referring to the default section uh, by name rather than by number. Um, and then we fix the the uh, ten thirty one language. The old language was not great. Uh, but now it reads appropriately. Uh, this agreement is intended to be an exchange pursuant to IRC 1031. Parties agree they shall perform all necessary acts and they shall execute all necessary documents to effectuate the exchange of properties provided such as at no additional cost to the uh, party not utilizing the exchange. So if you do have a 1031 exchange, you definitely want to be sure to drop that language in. Uh, for what it's worth, there is a, a general cooperation provision in the 401 that says everybody will play nice and be willing to sign things um, that are necessary for the other side to perform. In other words, it's kind of a good faith thing. Uh, if I need you to sign a document so I can get my loan approved and it doesn't hurt you, then you should sign the form. Otherwise, I won't be able to get my loan. And so you could argue that that would cover this as well, but I think it's best just to put it in there and be specific. Um, that's it on that. 
that's pretty much it. The the lease agreement, I have to admit, this falls under the commercial forms rather than the residential forms. And I do not work with that committee. So I'm ill-equipped to uh, to walk through it with you. Um, it is uh, in this packet that you have. You should have this packet. If you don't, all you got to do is go to forms on the fly on the uh, Tennessee Realtor site. And you can pull exactly what we're looking here and go through the lease if you happen to do property management. They did make some changes, I noted. New language is in blue, and then they struck. If they struck something, it's, it should have a red strike through it. Um, but I'll let you walk through that. Um, basically, that is it. Um, so open up to questions, or if you if there's anything else you want to talk about, happy to do it. Tom, you got anything you would like to address, or? Gosh, quiet bunch. Yeah, I got I got one. Oh, um, I have. I have one. The you know um, we had an issue in my office with um, the HBRs and people not checking um, the box that it's a HUD. Oh, a HUD. Remember yeah. Jason called. Yeah, and you're like, uh, you know, he's just kind of like he looked at everybody and no one checks it. Um, all the ones that are on the market right now, no one has it checked. And he just so happened to be the other side was a lawyer and was just trying to uh, make his day. Yeah. Why didn't they think about ch changing like that? Because that little gray area, because even though it is. I mean, it's, you know, the distinction between PUDs and condos and all that gets gets a little tricky sometimes. And um, I mean, a, an HPR is a, uh, basically a very small pud it's a it's a two property pud basically is how it's categorized and um, it's supposed to have a an entity that um, controls common areas and that's appropriately set up you know <laughs> I guess I'm blessed in a way because where I'm at we don't have a lot of those but I talk to lawyers in Nashville and surrounding areas that they go nuts over these things because a lot of times you know the the corporation, the LLC that um, that is supposed to be there for the common area management and so forth, it, it just goes defunct, and you know they don't they don't keep it up, and it is a problem. Yeah, but um, my personal opinion is that you, you should disclose it's a PUD because, in fact, it is. Um, maybe it's just an education issue. Um, but that's that's what I told him, and that that was my take on it. So it should be disclosed as a pud. Yeah. I have a quick question. Um, on our on our contract, it says with um, on closing, it says it is closed with payment of purchase price. When do you consider with split closings? When do you consider, or when is it closed? Yes, Especially right now with snow going on. Uh -oh. Here we go. Well, I just had a, <laughs> I just got out of a brouhaha myself. Um, we closed one on Friday. Well, don't, Todd, don't use that word. We signed. <laughs> the buyers had signed earlier. Our sellers couldn't come in until like 530. And so they come in at 530. They sign everything. And the buyers are insistent on getting keys. Uh, they had painters lined up for the next day, and it was just a, a nightmare, and it was a split. Well, the other company had gone home, so even if I wanted to deliver the deed, wasn't shove it under the door, maybe, but um, my take on this whole thing is, and the way I can show you where I get to it, let me do that, just so we're all kind of on the same page, uh, literally. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, let me go to this one. So um, paragraph, er, 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 where's my closing paragraph? There it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one line 191, this, this transaction shall be closed, capital C closed, evidenced by delivery of warranty deed and payment of purchase price, right? Those are, those are the two requirements. Right. So then if you go back up, 
up here. Um, the purchase price to be paid is blank. We're defining that as the purchase price, which shall be dispersed to seller or seller's agent by one of, one of the following methods. Wire transfer, cashier's check, such other form is approved by the seller. And so for me, I interpret that to say that, look, if the deed's been delivered to the other company um, and the wire has gone out and it goes to either the seller or the seller's closing agency, mm -hmm. once it hits, if I'm representing the seller, once it hits my account, I think it's closed. That's my take. It's not necessarily when the, the money hits the seller's bank account. I think me as their agent, once I get it, it's closed. That's the way I read it. Yeah. So the deed being delivered, I think, is the question on that. The deed yeah. has been signed, but due to FedEx delays, it has not gotten to the other, you know, the dispersing title company. Right. So that's where we were trying to figure out if it's closed or not. You well, know? And, no, and I, I don't think it's closed. And here's what here's what I worry about. Um, you know, in my situation, the buyers were very adamant about keys. You know, we're always thinking in terms of when does the buyer get keys? But I also think of it in terms of what if the thing burns down this, you know, this weekend? Right. And um, <laughs> we just talked about this. Well, I mean, the lender is going to be going, uh, send me back my money. It didn't fund, um, you know, and, the, and which insurance company is going to pick it up? I mean, so it really is important. And so I think even though it's really a weather related event, if the deed doesn't make it to the other side, I think you should do an extension because I don't think it's closed yet until it hits. I mean, I'm not going to disperse unless I have an original deed. And yeah. And she went ahead and sent the, the money where we're sellers. She went ahead and sent the money to our title company, but told her not to disperse until she had the original deed. So it's still not dispersed, you know. Tell you what, the other thing I do sometimes, and um, is is I will look as a practical matter. You know, I I will talk to the other company and agree they'll agree to fund on copies, right? Knowing that the FedEx is coming with a deed, but also I I make the sellers execute a duplicate. That's what she did. We I'm going to hold that. on to this. So if FedEx gets hit by a tornado or whatever, we're not all hung out here with no original deed that could be recorded. Right. So, you know, honestly, most title companies work pretty well together. That's been my experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, we try to make life easier for each other. Um, but, some, you know, sometimes the parties are, are difficult. And I've seen plenty of situations where the seller said, look, we had one seller call the police on the buyers because they had checked their bank account. It wasn't in their bank account and the people were moving in. Wow. And I had to tell the seller, uh, it's not your house anymore. I've got yeah. your money. Right. So. So Todd, but back on Gina's situation, just to clarify, they do have a duplicate deed. So is it then in fact closed? But it's not been delivered. No, it hasn't. Been, it's well, it's, in delivery hasn't been received, I guess. In delivery, but yeah. No, I think it's sort of like, for me, closing is like being pregnant. You're either pregnant or you are not pregnant. You're not sort of pregnant, right? There's a very- True. It's, it's 2024, Todd. Sorry, is that, can I not use that anymore? I thought it was a good example. I don't know. Um, mm, depends on the crowd. Well, I mean, the truth of it is, it's either closed or it's not. And, and I think if you don't have the delivery and acceptance and receipt of those funds, one side or the other, depending upon what they want the answer to be, could try to argue that it was or was not closed. And um, I worry about getting between two big behemoth insurance companies, both trying to claim that they don't it's have not. to cover it, you know? Yeah. So that's the way I read it. But if they, I mean, I, I see that point, but if they, um, you know, sent a copy and you already have their money, um, you know, I would, I would hope that they would work together and let them in the house. I mean, at that well, point. But, yeah. well, it's, not about, it's really not about letting them in the house. I mean, it sort of was. Right. Um, it's really more about if it burns down, 
tonight. I mean, that's the and the immediate didn't. the immediate problem, and and is, is can they move in? But the bigger legal issue is what if, and and we've had what ifs happen. We had a house hit by a tornado over the weekend one time. Um, I mean, it stuff can happen. So mm -hmm. I try to read it conservatively. And I think the part that can be sort of worked out and negotiated is the can they move in sort of thing. Um, the bigger issue is technically whose house is it still. So if you're going to let them move in and it hasn't completely funded, that's where you do your occupancy agreement and and so forth. Right. Um, yeah. Because we all understand we're going to play ball, and let you move in. But it's still my house. So, um yeah. I just don't need pipes bursting. Well, that was the other thing. Um, they, the sellers in this case, well, first off, the buyers have been very difficult. I'll leave it at that. And the other thing was the buyers were going to go in immediately and start painting and tearing stuff down. Yeah. And, and, and the seller was like, well, if your painter falls off the ladder, who are they going to sue? Yeah. Well, good point. You know? So Yeah try to solve the immediate thing. Maybe if everybody can get a comfort level, you let them move in with an occupancy agreement, but everybody still understand that it's still the seller's house. And so let's act accordingly. Um, I always, agents need to tell sellers, do not cancel your insurance till the money's sitting in your account, right? Yeah. Um, great question though. That That comes up a lot. It does. Yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's one of hey, those Todd. oddballs. <clears throat> yeah. Hey, Todd. Yes. Hey, this is Larry from the Jackson office. Um, I'm not a big fan like you of that terminating because repairs aren't done. You know, you always yeah. have the buyer say it's not done right. It's not done professionally. Has right. the committee ever considered in the seller's repair amendment to put in a some type of clause that uh, the buyer has went back out and checked on those repairs because it says that they're entitled to go out and reinspect them, but the completion of the repairs is a drop dead, you know, deadline. So I would think the forms committee needs to address that, you know, where you don't wait till the final inspection and terminate it. Okay. So in other words, they, they go out and do their completion of repairs inspection. They need to sign off on something saying we're good. Yeah, because it could be 10 days, 15 days prior to closing. Well, and and somebody else asked that question in another class. Um, and I was thinking through it. I mean, I guess what you would do, what you could do is once they go out and they do their their inspection for the repairs and they're satisfied with it, you know, propose that you enter into an amendment. That says, you know, buyers completed, uh, buyers satisfied with the completed repairs, or something to that effect. But that's a good point. I mean, maybe that is something they need to consider: is getting them to check off on that, so that you don't, so they don't back up on their final inspection and go, "No, nah, I thought about it more, and I don't think these were completed right." Right. Uh, that's my thing. It's a drop dead uh, timeline, and it's never mm -hmm. been uh, between them buyers and their agent to go back out and check, even though, you know, you could say that, just say they weren't done and drop yeah. dead. Well, uh, and, you know, somebody said in a class, well, I don't like this new provision because it gives the power to the buyer to just walk away. I'm like, well, not really. I mean, um, if I'm the holder of the earnest money and there's a good faith dispute, the seller's saying I did the repairs. I did them just like we talked about them. And the buyer saying, "Well, they weren't done close and you know well enough." I'm not dispersing anything. I mean, you're you are kind of where you would have been anyway uh, without this language. You're in court if both sides can't come to some agreement. Because even right. last year, if they didn't have the repairs done to the satisfaction of the buyer, I would have told the buyer, "Don't close." Right. Um, this year, it just kind of puts a finer point on it. Uh, but again, I think the lesson for me was, for gosh sakes, really detail exactly what you want as far as your repairs. And as a seller's agent, if the buyer sends you some half cocked, you know, repair amendment that isn't very, very clear, don't agree to it, you know? 
Oh, oh, something happened. Right. But I'm back. Um, right. I'm a big fan of what you said. Uh, do it in a uh, more closing expenses paid by the seller or. Yeah. And I realize some, I realize sometimes that's not possible, but in any case where you can do it, I'd do it for sure. I'll bring up, um, Larry, I'll bring up that point though, um, to the committee and see what they say. That's something I usually tell folks too, is if you do have some suggestions, um, please feel free to email me. My email address is up there. Um, I don't have any authority <laughs> whatsoever, but what I can do is, is submit it uh, to the forums committee. And Cindy Stanton is the uh, chairperson this year. Um, so you can submit to her or anybody that you know that's on the committee. But that's how these forms get better, um, is from lots and lots of people thinking about lots and lots of situations and then sending them in. So I really encourage you to do that. Thank you. Todd, I know you've mentioned this numerous times in the classes that I've sat in and how you're a big proponent, I think, of a due diligence period. Yeah. Versus, you know, and do we, should we even have earnest money? And because I can't tell you as a broker how many situations I was in last year where representing the seller, we could easily make an argument why buyers were not acting in good faith or had not upheld their portion of the contract. And every time I was told that, doesn't matter. They'll get their earnest money back. It's not worth fighting. Um, yeah, exactly. I, you know, I, I, again, when one day when I'm king, um, <laughs> that we will have a due diligence period, and we'll either have no earnest money or non-refundable earnest money, um, because I think anything other than that on earnest money just causes problems and gives a false sense of security to the seller. I mean, well, to the sellers. Um, and yeah, I, the due diligence thing, it, you know, that's why we get into all these, you know, option one, I'm going to terminate the contract. And on the way out the door, I'm going to tell you four or five things um, that are wrong with your house so that now you have a duty to either disclose them or fix them. You know, I just don't think it's a great idea. And the due diligence period we do on the lot land contract, you know, you have so many days and you can take it or leave it. And you don't have to specify what what you didn't like or anything else. You just didn't want it. And so that would be a much cleaner approach to me. But uh, again, I've, I've got no authority. So, but one day I'll be king. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I just feel like we, uh, we don't have as good a representation for our sellers as we do our buyers in our mm -hmm. purchase and sale agreement. But yeah. Well, and, you know, one thing I usually say, too, in classes, um, of course, in classes for credit, I'm stretching this because there's not as much to go over, frankly, but uh, it gives me an opportunity to stop and talk about like buyer's rep agreements and how important it is that you present those two buyers in a very clear way. Um, there was a couple of cases that came out, one at the end of last, was it last year or the year before, uh, where the judge really hammered on um, they they disallowed a, a commission pursuant to a buyer's rep agreement. And the judge really hammered on the fact that the agent did, he they believed him that he, that he did in fact tell the buyer they were signed a buyer's representation agreement, but he admitted the agent that he never said the word exclusive. And the court really hammered on the fact that you have to disclose that you were signed, I mean, that they are signing an exclusive buyer's representation agreement. And um, it's so important now for, well, the the, the pending um, mammoth case and everything else going on, transparency is so important. And so just always be sure to really make it clear to your buyer, look, these are the documents I'm sending you electronically. Talk to them about what they're signing so that, um, you know, there's no, so later on when the lawsuit comes, which I hope it never comes, but if it does, you can affirmatively state to the court, we talked about it. And here I itemized the forms that I was sending to them, right? Um, it just helps. So, Todd, how closely, and I don't want to get into all the things that could happen 
with the lawsuits that are out there right now between NAR and several large companies, several small companies. But how closely is the Forms Committee looking at language, you know, clauses, things like that, that agents could easily introduce uh, seller paid buyer representation fees that are not offered, but part of the contract negotiations. It's it's a dicey little area. And, yeah. you know, of course, we were at the tail end of the year uh, when that when that case came down and pretty much all the changes were finalized and we weren't really going to get into it. Right. You know, my position on that whole case is I don't think we have to change anything we do. If we Correct. do, if we do what we're supposed to do already. Correct. And do it well, there's nothing to change. Um, for me, it's, it's a transparency issue and making sure that the seller understands that you've got an option. You know, you can offer, we can offer a cooperative share or we cannot. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, you just need to understand there may be a smaller pool of buyers who can buy your right. home. And for buyers, making sure they understand why did, you know, I expect to get paid as a buyer's agent, I expect to get paid and this is what I'm going to get paid. Now, in some cases, there'll be a cooperative share, but where there's not, you're going to have to pay me. And so I think the rules are all there that, you know, a seller's never had to offer a cooperative share, you know, right. forever. Correct. And yet they, they mischaracterize it to these eight rental people. All, all the jurors were renters, from my understanding. Um, I just think it was a crazy, yeah. crazy case. And look, people One think- One that you would never thought would have gotten that far, but it did. And now everybody's saying, what? You yeah. Know? Well, all I know is this, if if it gets to the point where buyers can't afford to have buyers agents, uh, that's a sad day. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, it's that's a very it. sad day. So I'm hoping that it gets kicked back and overturned and, and we can. But but it is something, though, that we need to be cognizant of is the transparency issue, you know, making sure we talk about these things. So. But beyond yeah. that, I haven't really gotten into it too much. Um, there, there could be discussions this year about, you know, are there things we could tweak, um, you know, in the compensation agreement or even in how we define closing costs or excuse me, closing costs, buyer expenses. Sorry. I'm, old habits die hard. Um, you know, could buyer expenses include buyer agents commissions? Right. Sure could. And that's the kind of thing I was talking about from the language and some of the clauses and things like that, yeah. you know, being more clear as to, yeah, you're paying this much towards buyer's closing costs and this amount towards buyer's representation costs or whatever it might be. So that at closing table, it's understood that is a pool, you know. Well, kind of thing. I mean, that's certainly something, you know, it'd be great if, if I mean, if I would say this, some, I'd encourage you to submit something, you know, about yeah. that because, and I don't know the answer and, but it's certainly worth thinking about. And I because, don't think anything is going to change anytime quick as a result of lawsuits that will keep being tangled up in appeals and things like that. But I, I do know our industry in that there may be some people, you know, you just say a group of agents or an agent who says, you know, my listing presentation is going to be based on you do not have to pay. And they're going to maybe not explain the value of pay, paying a co-op commission mm -hmm. just to get the listing. Well, then all yeah. of a sudden we do have opportunities to go look at listings where nothing's being offered, at which point in time our buyer's agency agreement kicks in, some mm -hmm. of which the buyers can pay, some which cannot pay. So what is that language that allows us to still participate in the American dream, right. you know, saying it the right way and protecting our client? It's, this is a, it's a challenge. And I would actually, I would love to, I'd love if they would take that up and, and, and ponder it because I can't see why um, off the top of my head, why we couldn't widen the, the definition of buyer expenses somewhat. 
to positive. Because like you said, we're not really changing anything based on, uh, well, mm -hmm. the verdicts haven't necessarily been uh, handed out at this, excuse me, injunctive relief has not been handed out at this point in time. But yeah. in some of the cases where settlements have occurred, you know, there is some information there that you can begin working from as to what might this environment entail, you know, kind of thing. Did you see the uh, NAR had a, a a video in the last week or two about how to talk to your client, talk to your, I think it was a buyer client specifically about um, commissions. Um, it was really good. And, and it really, they're, they're driving home the position that look, nothing's going to change in terms of, our rules meet scrutiny under antitrust law. Right. So there's real, if if you said what do I need to change to be within the law? I think we everything that we have in place is was put there to protect right. because we always have known that we're under scrutiny, right? But yeah, I think that court, well, those attorneys were successful in mischaracterizing what it is we do and how we do it and why we do it. Um, Correct. I just think it was a bad. I don't know if it's a bad jury or bad facts or whatever, but it just uh, bad representation. Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm those lawyers probably make a thousand dollars a nanosecond. Those are high dollar lawyers. And I uh, but I just didn't appreciate the fact that they seem to miss the point, which is sellers have never had to offer a cooperative share yet. Correct. You know, they seem to be able to paint it like, you know, we're forcing them to. Mm -hmm. But again, it's it's having the discussion and the transparency. So I don't think we have to change anything. We may have to adapt some tools, you know, to be able to function in a slightly different environment. Um, but yeah, my, that's what I was trying to say is that the injunctive relief that has been given so far in the settlements is not a change in operations. You know, yeah. it is transparency, like you said. Yeah, uh, it's my concern that some agents might take the worst case scenario of um, the plaintiffs and say, well, we're not paying this and we're not paying that. And mm -hmm. we're introduced to that more than we've ever been. And then, therefore, how do we working with buyers agents communicate to the seller these expenses we're asked to be paid for from you using mm -hmm. the right terms of closing a co cost? buyer expenses, whatever it may be, you know, yep. just be prepared to do I, that. Should we yeah. ourselves as an industry start doing that uh, to the market? You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, in, in some ways it's, it's, it's all coming out of the same pot. And if I'm a yep. buyer and I really want you to represent me and, and my commission would cost me $5,000 there's certainly nothing that would prevent you from writing an, an offer and asking for 5,000 closing costs. It's the same money. Um, yeah. And so if they pay 5,000 and whatever, that will help the buyer afford to pay you the commission. Um, so it's all kind of the same money. And it's, yeah. <laughs> I just think, um, man, they must've been really good lawyers. Um, <laughs> I just, I can't get it. I don't get it. Or some but, bad ones. <laughs> or some bad ones, but oh Lord. Um, what other, any other questions you have? I didn't, I don't know how to open the chat here. Let's see. Yeah, Tom, I can't access the chat either. But I, I see there are no questions. There are no the questions. Chat. Okay. Yeah. So um, if, if you have other things you want to talk about, I'm happy to do that. Otherwise I'll hush and let y'all get to your, to your day. But um I enjoyed it. I would appreciate you taking the time to do this. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, as you're, always. You're welcome. Thank Sorry you. about the technical glitch. I'll have to get look into that a little bit. But otherwise, y'all holler if you have any questions and hope to see you soon. Thanks, Todd. All Thanks. right. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Hey, Michelle.